Hey, it's Rachel. I mentioned in a recent video that I was installing a drip irrigation system in the garden behind me. Finished that, thought I would show you guys the full design, the detailed list of parts and specifications, and the total cost of the system, as well as the cost per square foot that I irrigated for anybody else that might be trying to do something similar. Start with what I'm irrigating. I am only irrigating the 10 annual beds in the center of my garden. I did a prior video on how to think about sizing an irrigation system. And in that, I mentioned my total gallons of precipitation I receive every year exceeds the gallons I need for the garden, meaning my perennial plants that I have at the north, east, and west perimeter of the garden, once well established, really don't need much irrigation. I wanted to focus the drip system on those 10 beds in the center, give each of them an inch of week during the growing season. I did want to retain the ability to use a hose to spot water the perennials when I'm establishing new plants or during periods of extreme high heat. I did need that hose to stay hooked up. That was one of my design requirements. I also need the ability to turn individual beds on and off during the growing season because not everything is planted at the same time and I don't want to irrigate things when it's not necessary. I did not, however, feel the need to break the beds down into different zones. There are ways that you could turn on and off individual drip lines. I chose not to do that for this design. I just did not need that level of specificity. I'm either watering the entire bed or none of it. One last important aspect of the design, I needed a standard layout for all 10 beds. I did not want to have to pick up and move the strip irrigation around as I rotated the beds every year. That meant finding one layout for each bed that would work with a variety of different planting layouts. My faucet is located at the southwest corner of my garden shed. Let me first walk through those faucet connections and the different parts you're going to need when you branch off the water supply. Here's the full setup. Our faucet comes out here. Attach a brass Y to this. It has built-in shutoff valves, which means I can leave this one open permanently, go into our automatic water timer, and I leave this one closed. When I want to use my hose over there, I just open this valve, and I can then use the hose, turn it off the rest of the time. This is designed to operate under standard pressure all the time. This valve can be left open. That's your second part. Part number three, backflow preventer. This stops anything that comes into these lines from getting back into the water supply. Important and in many jurisdictions, I think it's legally required. After the backflow preventer, we have a pressure regulator. This is incredibly important. Drip irrigation is not designed to operate under full pressure that you would get coming out of a household faucet. It's designed usually for eight to 10 pounds per square inch of pressure. This reduces the pressure coming out of here down to 10 PSI. And then my last fitting is this connector. It has a female hose thread here that screws onto my pressure regulator. And then it has a twist and lock fitting. The way these work is you screw them up out of the way, you push your tubing onto the end, and then you screw this thing down tight to hold it and lock it in place. This translates from the hose thread that all of these parts are designed for and connects it securely to my tubing, which then runs down from here and off and down into my garden. Here is the list of those parts and the cost for each one. Just branching off the water supply and starting my main run of tubing, I was already at around $70 worth of parts. I got all of these from Drip Depot, not sponsored or affiliated, that's just where I found everything. These prices that I'm listing are in the Midwest and they are as of July, 2025, depending on your region and when you are watching this video factor in the cost of living for your area as well as inflation. Now about half of that was my automatic waterer. This was not by any means the most expensive option on the site. You might be able to find something even less expensive than this from that hose connection. The main line of tubing runs off the faucet towards the west and then does a turn and heads south down the main center walkway of my garden. I'll rotate the view here so north is facing up and zoom in a little bit and you can see what that looks like. I did not want that main supply line running right down the center of that main walkway. I didn't want it getting stepped on, and so I offset it off to one side. I ended that main supply run with a T connector at the last two beds. All of the other beds, I have a four-way or cross connector that allows the water to branch off and run water to the beds. I'll zoom back out quickly, north facing to the right, so you guys can see the whole system. In total, I had one T connector at the end of the main line of tubing, and I had four of those four-way connectors for the other eight beds. That twist and lock connection system that I mentioned when I was talking about the faucet fitting is the system for all of the T and all of the cross connectors. Here we have the T connector. Main line comes down, ends in this T, and splits off to the two beds, as you can see here. 
all of the other beds heading towards the faucet back up to the top of the garden are connected with these cross connectors to allow the water to continue down to those last two beds. You can see here my main line running down the center aisle, kind of off to the side, and then these branching connections. Worth noting, I did not cut all these things to size and then come out here and connect them. I laid everything out with one long piece of tubing first, all the way from the back up to the front. And then as I was putting in the manifolds and cross connecting, then and only then am I going through with scissors, cutting the tubing and splicing in these connectors. And it does mean I end up with little waste pieces here and there, but this kind of like a, a dry fitting approach allows me to subtly adjust as I go, rather than risking having, as an example, a 20 foot piece of tubing that's just, you know, a foot too short and I have to throw the whole thing away. I'd rather have those little bit of excess waste here and there and flexibility as I'm laying this thing out to make sure that overall I have the final design and the layout that I want. Expanding my parts list to show all of those various connectors and the tubing. I'm now up to about $120 in parts. Quick note, these tubings are not sold by the linear foot. You have to buy them in preset lengths. In my case, I bought a 250 foot roll. That was more than I needed, but the next size down would have been too little. The closer that your needs ladder up to the standard sizes of these things that are available, the more cost effective your whole design is going to be. That's why I ran water off the main line. Let's look at what happens at the beds themselves. I used that same tubing to build a manifold that served each bed, meaning I had 10 of these manifolds in total. Each manifold has an elbow fitting that connects it to the main lines. There's then an on-off valve that allows me to turn the water on and off to each bed individually. You can see the irrigation going to the bed of beans, melons, and squash is turned on, but over here, Turn the valve off to stop the water from going into my fallow bed because it just has a terminated cover crop in it at the moment. Each manifold has an end fitting that I can open up to allow the system to drain at the end of the year. That was important because I plan to leave this whole drip irrigation system in place through the winter. Because these systems are designed to operate at a low pressure, you cannot blow air through them to winterize them. By simply removing those end caps on each of the manifolds, the water can run out, and the tubing being open at the end means it can accommodate any water that freezes and expands inside of the tubing. I'll expand the parts list again to show these manifolds. All 10 of them added about $45 to the cost of the system, and I'm running at about $165. We now need to run drip tape onto the beds themselves. Let me show you how you connect the drip tape to the tubing. I purchased a punch tool as part of this design. You use that punch tool to create a hole in the tubing. You then insert a connector. Those connectors have a barb on one side that pops into the tubing, and then they have a twist and lock fitting on the other side. And here's what that looks like once all of the barb connectors are installed. The L is pointing that way. My on-off is facing up, and my barb emitters are going the opposite direction of the L. So the water comes in that side and then comes out this side. For the manifolds, I had an end piece that I could screw off and remove. The drip tape does not work that way. The ends are rolled up and sealed. You need to close off the end of the drip tape or else water would just flow out the end. I take the end and I roll once, twice, three times. Nice little roll there, try and zoom in for you. And then they sell these end caps that you just slide on the end. It takes a little bit of maneuvering. I use my fingernails to kind of push it in from the top. There you go. And you can see my next emitter is now here. You want to have enough tape at the end with no emitter in it. You can't really roll the tape where this emitter is present. You want to have as long of a piece as possible with no emitters to enable an easy, tight roll at the end. I try and cut my ends just short of an emitter. So the next emitter would have been here and I cut off at that point to leave as much free tubing as I can. All right, I just have to do this about a hundred more times. At the ends of the beds, in addition to this being capped off, I do a pretty sharp vertical return against the edge of the CMU to create a further pinch point and help really seal the end. Those are held in place with landscape staples. The staples do not go through the tape. They go outside of it. I've pressed those staples pretty firmly into the ground to again help pinch it off. And at this end, I do use a tape measure to space these out and put them in place. Connecting those barbed emitters to your drip tape is very similar. You take this green ring and you twist it all the way back to expose this end. 
you slide your drip tape on top. It's a little bit easier than the tubing, it's much thinner. And then you twist the green ring to lock it in place. And this rotates, so you can make, rotate to make sure your emitters are facing up. Quick hard-earned tip that I thought I'd pass on. Much like the end that I mentioned when I was twisting it up, I didn't want to have an emitter in that area. You don't want to have an emitter in the area as you're trying to slide it onto here. It makes it very difficult to do. You want a nice clean end. For that reason, I would recommend cutting all of your runs of drip tape just a little bit long. And then when I'm ready to install it, I feel around for the emitters and I cut just past one, which means I have a nice stretch here with no emitters in it. And that makes it much easier to slide it onto this end and then lock it securely in place with no leaks. I did decide to purchase a thicker 15 mil drip tape. That has an expected life of about five to 10 years. You can buy thinner walled drip tape. If I had purchased a cheaper one, I might be more worried about removing this and winterizing it every year. This left the big question of how many lines did I need per bed, going back to that standard layout I mentioned from before. I don't just have 10 beds. I have 10 beds that are subdivided in half, meaning there's 20 different planting areas. And in many cases on a given bed, I'll have a different layout on the north half of the bed and the south half of the bed. That meant I had even more than 10 layouts that I needed to accommodate. I'll zoom in on a couple of half beds to show you what I'm talking about. Each of these are 32 inches wide, but if you look as an example at my tomato and pepper bed, it is an asymmetrical layout. There's roughly 20 inches dedicated to the tomatoes and then only 12 inches dedicated to the peppers versus something like my potato bed where they grow and cover the entirety of it. Something like kale is planted in a zigzag pattern across the bed to make full use of it. And my mixed greens bed is planted in long linear strips, but I iterated and did find one layout that did work for all of these. If I run one line of drip tape down the center of each bed and two more lines of drip tape inset six inches from each edge of the bed, I figured out that it would work well for basically all of my bed layouts. Tomato bed here at the top, the tomatoes are planted in between two lines of drip tape, gives them a lot of water. The pepper is planted essentially all along another row of drip tape. The potatoes get a nice even distribution of water across the whole surface of the bed. And my zigzag planting of things like kale, they end up landing right in between those lines of drip tape, meaning they'll get a little bit of water from both sides. That's nice. And it works very well for things like my salad greens bed where they're planted in continuous rows right along that drip tape. What this meant for the total design was that I needed three lines of drip tape for each half bed or six lines of drip tape on all 10 of my beds. Show that here with these yellow double arrows. If you go back to our parts list and add in the drip tape and all of the fittings needed to connect it to my manifolds, you can see this is where the bulk of the cost comes from. I mentioned before the challenge with this stuff is it's not sold by the linear foot. In theory, I needed about 1,400 feet of drip tape. Unfortunately, the size options in the spec that I wanted were a 1,000 foot roll or a 3,600 foot roll. And I had to go for the 3,600 foot roll. You can see it had a significant impact on the total cost of the system. Hopefully what you need better lines up with the standard sizes available. Adding everything up, the total cost of my system came to around $565. That worked out to 47 cents a square foot for the area that I was irrigating. If I could have bought half as much of the drip tape, meaning if they sold it in an 1800 foot length, that would have been enough for my needs. It would have dropped the whole price of this system down to 33 cents a square foot or roughly one third cheaper. Again, a lot of this comes down to how well your needs match up with the standard unit sizes available in the marketplace. Then I'd end with a quick source to end trail of water through the garden. So it comes out of the faucet, hits the Y, branches off, goes through that valve that is perpetually open, stops at the timer. When the timer program kicks in, it opens that, water runs down through the backflow preventer, through the pressure regulator, cuts the pressure to 10 PSI. That connector links it down into my tubing. We run down the tubing into the garden and we hit this four-way connector. Runs over here, runs over here. Now, this one happens to be closed because this is my cover crop bed that I just terminated. I'm not actively watering the bed. Pretend for a minute that this is open. Water would flow through here into these barbed connectors and down the drip tape. Turn here so you can see this. Three on each bed. Runs all the way down. Do, 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 do. Slowly dripping. And then terminates here at the end of the bed. Now that it's installed, how long do I need to run this thing? I'm working with lines that are 272 inches long. When you buy your drip tape, you're going to select the emitter spacing, how close they are together in the line of drip tape. 
as well as the speed of the emitters, how quickly water can exit from those emitters. I chose closer four inch spacing because I wanted even coverage across the beds and then a medium flow rate. The flow rate is really based on your soil. If you have something like heavy clay that drains poorly, you'll want a very slow rate on that emitter to avoid flooding your garden. If you have sandy soil, go the opposite direction. I've got a nice mix in those beds and I went ahead and used a medium rate emitter of 0.25 gallons per hour. I have a 272 inches of line, one emitter every four inches, and each of those emitters emitting 0.25 gallons per hour means that in total, each line is delivering 17 gallons per hour. I have six lines per bed. When you multiply that out, I'm getting 102 gallons per hour to the bed. Converting that into minutes, I'm receiving 1.7 gallons per minute on the beds. Great, how much do I need? If you look at the beds, I don't need to water the whole thing. They each have a permanent walkway down the middle, dividing them into the two different beds. Each bed half is 32 inches wide. They are 22 feet, nine inches long. That's 8,704 square inches. Two of those per bed works out to 121 square feet per bed that needs to be watered, or 17,408 square inches. Why am I even bothering to talk about this in square inches? It's because the calculations you're going to run for what you need are going to be in cubic inches. I had 17,408 square inches on each bed, I mentioned before I want to give each of them one inch of water per week. Converting that into gallons, one gallon is 231 cubic inches, and in total I need about 76 gallons per week per bed. Now I'm not planning on just doing one humongous watering once a week. I'm anticipating running this three times a week or three waterings, and that means I need roughly 25 gallons per watering. If you go back into the math we did before on the rate that's delivered at, I'm receiving 1.7 gallons per minute on those beds. If I insert that in, I find that in order to receive the 25 gallons that I need, I need to water them for 15 minutes total. That means I will run this system 15 minutes, three times a week, and I've set up my automatic timer to do just that. I hope that was helpful for anybody else laying out one of these systems. This wasn't cheap, but for a garden of this size, I felt it was pretty reasonable. And again, if your needs better ladder up with those standard sizes for the tubing and the tape, you could come in much, much cheaper than I did per square foot. I would recommend looking up ahead of time what those standard lengths are and seeing if you can play with your layout to try and better ladder them up. It didn't occur to me until it was too late. That said, I'm still glad that I did it. It's a more efficient use of water than when I'm hand watering everything. I've got a better survival rate on my plants and it's saving me a ton of time and effort, allowing me to redeploy that time to tasks like weeding or pest control that would cause much bigger issues in my garden if I didn't get in front of them. All in all, I think it's worth it, but take a look at your system and see whether the math makes sense for you. I hope that was helpful. If I didn't mention something or if you have specific questions, drop them below and I'll do my best to answer. Until next time, thanks.